recording. So our last speaker for, for the session is uh, Ella Hismayer from uh, UC Berkeley. So take it away, Ella. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for organizing this conference and for the chance to speak. So my talk will about, will, is about large deviations of the largest eigenvalue of sparse random graphs with non-Gaussian edgeweights. Um, and this is joint work with Shishen Duganguli and Kyun Siknam. So I'll start by introducing our model. Um, so we start off with a sparse Edelstraini graph. Um, the sparsity we consider is d over n, where d is a constant. And this regime is interesting because um, real life networks are often sparse in that way. Um, because in that case, the average degree is a constant as well. Um, so now that we have this level of randomness, which is the graph, which I will depict in blue from now on, we add random weights to the edges, which will be uh, usually green. Um, these random weights are IID, and I'll, list, I'll specify the distribution later. But yeah, so basically whenever there's an edge between two vertices, rather than depicting this connection by a one, we will depict the connection by a certain random number. Um, we now, oh, and the reason why we want to add weights is because in like electrical networks, this can represent conductances. In social networks, it can represent the strength of a connection and so on. So now that we have this random weighted graph, we encode it in an adjacency matrix. So we put a zero whenever there's no edge between two vertices. And when there is a connection, we put the random, the value of the random variable there. Um, so this adjacency matrix is symmetric because, because it because of how the graph, because it comes from this graph, which implies that the eigenvalues are real and we can order them. Now we can ask about these eigenvalues, how they behave in a typical regime. Um, so for instance, like derive some law of large numbers, but in our case, we want to ask about the atypical regime. So the question we want to ask is about large deviations of the largest eigenvalue. So what's the probability that the largest eigenvalue is larger than its expected value by a factor of one plus delta? Um, you can similarly consider the lower tail, so the probability that it's atypically small, but for, the, for this talk, I will focus on the upper tail. Um, so yeah, so short, uh, a very short um, uh, comment about large deviations. Um, so it general, large deviations are generally about asymptot the asymptotic probability of rare events. And they're pretty well understood by now for linear functions of random variables. For instance, for a sum of IID random variables, which is the simplest example, we can derive that the, the um, probability that the sum exceeds its expected value by this factor of one plus delta is approximately e to the minus n times a function of delta. And this the part of the exponent that depends on n is usually called the speed and the the, the, like, the, the, the constant we multiply with that depends on delta is called the rate function. And I refer to these terms later in the talk as well. So there's other um, functions, uh, linear functions of random variables that we know the large deviations of by similar methods. But the, the case that we're interested in is actually a nonlinear function of random variables. So we still have an underlying IID setting because each entry in our matrix is IID. But um, the eigenvalue of that matrix depends on the, on the entries of the matrix in a nonlinear way because um, it is basically the supremum of linear functions. And similarly, subgraph counts are nonlinear functions of the underlying matrix because um, they depend on a polynomial of the edge of the matrix entries. So, uh, I, so the, there's a few classical settings where the large deviation behavior of the largest eigenvalue has been studied. Um, an example is the Gaussian Wigner matrix that has, has already been mentioned a few times. Um, and in that case, we again get a large deviation probability of e to the minus n times some rate function. Um, and this was the first setting in which um, this large deviation event was um, determined. Another classical setting that is in the other um, 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 regime of randomness that we're interested in is our dense or the training graphs. So in that case, um, yeah, with the matrix only consists of zeros and ones and the speed of the large deviation probability is n squared rather than n. Um, so we can generalize these, these results in different ways. 
First of all, on the graph level, we can make the graph sparser by letting p go to zero with n rather than taking it to be a constant. Um, or even, yeah, or and for, for the edge weights, we can, rather than just take Gaussian weights, we can take sub-Gaussian weights or lighter or heavier tailed weights. Um, I'll, the reason why we want to try to look at different edge weights is because we're interested in universality results, which means that we want, it's interesting to see whether the large deviation probability depends ex on the precise distribution of the weights or whether in specific regimes, the rate function or, and also the speed um, are the same no matter what the precise edge weights are. So here are some results that have been proved over the last, I guess, like 25 years or so. Um, um, yeah, and let me maybe just point out that for the case of sparse um, graphs without edge weights, the specific sparsity regime also matters a lot. So whether P is larger than, for instance, one over root N or smaller than that and so on, makes a diff big difference in how you have, how, which methods work for the, to study your graph. And one of the results that is mentioned here was already presented early this morning. So this paper by Bhattacharya, Bhattacharya and Ganguly considers the case of a graph where P is equal to D over N without edge weights. And so our result today, which is at the bottom right, is about these kind of sparse graphs with um, edge weights that have lighter or heavier tails and Gaussians. So this is the statement of our result. We start off with a graph that has, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, sparsity D over N, and the edge weights are IID such that the probability that the edge weight in absolute value is larger than T is E to the minus T to the alpha, approximately. And this means that when alpha is larger than two, we have lighter tails and Gaussians, and when alpha is uh, smaller than two, we have heavier tails and Gaussians. So for the case of light tails, the large deviation probability can be shown to be approximately one over n to the one plus delta squared minus one. And um, I want to point out that the rate function here does not depend on alpha. So in this case, we have a universality result where as long as the tails are lighter than Gaussians, the specific edge weights distribution doesn't matter. And in particular, if you take alpha to be infinity here, you can, you, like in quotation marks, you can view this as the case of graphs with um, constant edge weights, which corresponds to the result um, by, that I mentioned earlier by Bhattacharya, Bhattacharya and Ganguly, and they have the same rate function as well. And now for the heavy tails, we have two different regimes. We have a regime where alpha is between one and two, in which case the rate function depends on alpha in a, um, a bit more complicated way, that, so, which is why I didn't write it out. So we have an expression for this, but it's not entirely explicit. And for alpha, <coughs> sorry. For alpha smaller than one, we get a rate function of one plus delta to the alpha minus one. So um, here, the specific distribution of the edge weights does make a difference since the rate function depends on alpha. And, but you can see that all of these um, probabilities are polynomial in N rather than exponential as, what, um, in the, as it was in the results we've seen before. Yeah, and for sake of completeness, let me mention that the case alpha is equal to, which is approximately the Gaussian, which is the Gaussian case. Um, um, it has been covered by Ganguly and Nam in this early this year. And in that case, we get a rate function that is similar to um, the rate function. The expression is similar to the rate function for when alpha is between two and one. Uh, so in the last few minutes, I just want to mention quickly the idea of proof. Um, so, as a, so we start off with a graph that has um, edge weights. And now the first step is to partition these edge weights into those that are smaller than a certain threshold and those that are larger than a certain threshold. So from now on, I will depict those that are larger than the threshold by thick lines and those that are smaller by th thin lines. So once we separate the graph into these two graph into these two separate graphs, we can first show that the graph that has only low edge weights is spectrally negligible in the sense that it doesn't contribute much to the largest eigenvalue. So we now can focus on just the graph with the high edge weights. Uh, in the regime, I will now only talk with the regime alpha larger than two. When alpha is smaller than two, we need to proceed somewhat differently. 
But if alpha is larger than two, so when we have light tails, um, we can further partition this graph into, say, separate into two graphs where we have only low degree vertices in one of them and we have only high degree vertices in the other one. Um, the high degree vertex graph will only contain disjoint stars. And this decomposition that we're using here has also been used to study the largest eigenvalue of other training graphs without, as sparse other training graphs without edge weights. But we can then again show that the graph that only has low degree vertices is spectrally negligible um, in the sense that it doesn't, it, the probability that um, it doesn't have a very small eigenvalue is small. And now that we have this graph with, that only contains stars, what we need to use is that the largest eigenvalue of the graph of this graph of disjoint stars is just the maximum of all the eigenvalues um, where we, uh, over all the stars in the graph. So we can consider, so we, all, so we need to look at the eigenvalue of each star, which we know to be the sum of the squares of the edge weights um, but, and the square root of that. Um, and so once we, by using this result, we then can then use, we then need to trade off between the fact that we tend to have more stars of lower degrees, but we have the stars that have a higher degree tend to have a larger eigenvalue because there's more weights to, that are summed up. Um, and so by figuring out what the best way of trade, of trade the best trade off between these two um, quantities is, we can find our large deviation probability. And yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs>